Well, good morning. A little hard to believe it's Friday already. Uh, we wait and wait to get here, and you know, Monday, Tuesday, and it feels like it's sort of going to last forever, and then it's Friday, and I'm grateful for what God has done this week. I know for some of you, this is your last chapel, your last full day here at Chehi, which is always fun to think about, but uh, I want to thank you for the privilege of, of getting to be here with you. I've enjoyed getting to know so many of you. For you that will be here next week, looking forward to that and getting to know you better. Uh, if you are headed home and you want to stay in touch or contact, you can find me on Instagram, Pastor Dan Davis uh, is the best way. I'm also on Facebook, but I know that's mostly for old people. So um, would love to, love to stay in touch with you and uh, always hear what God's doing in your life or shoot me a message, let me know how I can pray for you or encourage you in your walk with Christ. What do you think about when you hear the word obedience? I want some feedback this morning. So just when I say obedience, I want just like the first thing, as long as it's an appropriate thing, the first thing that pops into your mind. Yes, back here. Trusting even when you're doubting. All right, somebody else. Yes. Hard. Hard. What else? Back here. Yes. All right, doing, doing what someone asks you to do because you love them and trust them. We're gonna, hold on to that thought because that's basically where we're going this morning. Any other things that come to mind when you think of obedience? Yes. Yeah. Doing something you don't want to be doing. I identify with that. All right, one more in the back. Ooh. Ooh. All right. I have found someone who, you know, you and I, we are on the same page. All right. You know, my initial reaction to obedience is, ah, like that's going to be, that sounds restrictive, right? That sounds like it might not be fun. That's what my kids should do. That's what my pets should do. Are you with me? You know, and even I, I was talking about this at breakfast when I, I came back as a chapel speaker in 2009 and they sent me the list of rules that they send you and I was looking at it and I thought, ouch, this is not going to be any fun at all. Did I really like this place? But what we're going to see today as we continue our, our journey with, with Moses and what I've learned and discovered through my relationship with Christ and what God's Word clearly teaches us is that we are called to obedience as followers of Christ. And we've been talking about following God into the unknown. None of us know what the future holds. I mean, we ultimately know what it holds in that one day we know that God is calling us to be with Him in his kingdom forever and ever and ever. And so there's a sense as believers that we have such an incredible hope because we know where this all ends. We are going to be with Jesus forever and we're going to be with each other, right? And there won't be last days or goodbyes. Aren't you grateful for that? And so we have that incredible hope. But until then, God calls us to follow him and to trust him with our lives and to serve him. And that requires us Stepping out into the unknown. And to do that, God calls us to obey Him. And I want us to see that that call of obedience is based out of love, right? And not, not out of duty or law. Notice what Jesus said before we get to Moses. John chapter 14, verse 15. The night before Jesus goes to the cross, He says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he didn't say this to his disciples. Remember, he's speaking to the, the 12 that he's closest to and has poured into and ministered to for the last three and a half years. And, and, and he, I don't think it's, it's not a, like sort of a passive aggressive thing. Like, if you love me, you, you'll keep my commandments. But it's more of, if you love me, if you would just know my love, if you would just experience and live in and abide in my love and my incredible love for you, which I'm about to demonstrate most fully as I go to the cross for you tomorrow. If you, if, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That, that, that out of loving me, you will, I will give you a desire and ability to obey me and to trust me. And so God calls us to obey him. Right? That, that loving God leads us to obeying him. Jesus is not just looking for us to agree with him. He's not just looking for warm affection, but he's calling us to obey him. And obeying God is essential. We're going to see that today that, that obeying God is essential, right, in following God. 
You know, that, that word essential is a word that you know, we've heard a lot over the last year and a half, isn't it? And sometimes it gets overused, but I want you to see today that it is indeed essential to follow God through obedience. Now, when we left Moses off yesterday, he was in a very dark place, a very difficult place. And so let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter 6 and see what God is going to do. And we're going to see how God brings Moses to a place of obedience. Exodus chapter 6, and let's begin in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, now remember, Moses is in a dark place, right? Moses is saying, God, why did you ever send me, right? This this is exactly what I was afraid of. This is not what I thought it was going to be. The Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. He says, Moses, you are going to see what I'm going to do. Moses, it's never been about you. It's about me. I will do what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand. He will let them go. Not because of you, because of me. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God is saying to Moses, what you've experienced is not a setback to my plan. I knew this all along. I told you, Moses, that Pharaoh wouldn't listen to you at first, but to speak anyway. And then notice what what God says in verse 2, what he reminds Moses of. He says, God said to Moses, verse 2, I am the Lord. Now, why do you think he says that? Right? I mean, God's already revealed himself in the burning bush. He, you know, he's already revealed his name. Say that I am who I am has sent me. Right? God has already revealed himself to Moses, but he says to Moses, I am the Lord. Why do you think he said that? I think it was because Moses needed a reminder. Right? Because sometimes the circumstances of life and the stuff that we go through and the things that happen to us and the things that we go through cause us to forget who God is. They cause us to, to forget his power and his goodness and his mercy and his love and his grace. And sometimes we just forget And so God reminds Moses, he says, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. Look at verse 3. I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not fully make myself known to them, but I have to you, is basically what he's saying. Verse 4. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. He reminds Moses, I've given you the privilege of knowing me by name. Verse 5, Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Have have you noticed this week, as we've gone through the story, how many times God says that He sees His people? How many times that he, He reminds Moses, I am aware of their suffering. I am not unsympathetic to their pain and to their, their, the plot that they're in. I am not unaware And I have remembered, I am faithful to my covenant. God saw and he was totally committed to keeping his promises. So look at verse 6. Therefore, say to the Israelites. Remember the Israelites, the Hebrew people, they're upset with Moses. Right? They're upset with Moses because Moses has showed up on the scene and said, God appeared to me in a burning bush and he showed me these miraculous signs and God's going to set you free. And they believed him and they were relieved and they were excited that their oppression was going to end. But then Pharaoh made things worse for them. Their life was harder than ever, more painful than ever. But God says, go back to them and say, I am the Lord. Remind them who I am. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. Verse 7, I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Do you notice how often that phrase, I will, is repeated? Right? Anytime we see repetition in Scripture, it's drawing our attention in. And God is using repetition to, to communicate to Moses and for what Moses will communicate to the people, that God is the one that's going to do this. Moses might be the human agent that God has chosen to be his spokesperson and Aaron with him. But it's not about them. Right? And when God calls us to serve him, right, it's not about us. Right? It's not about 
our talents and giftedness and abilities. Yes, God's given you to them, given you talents and abilities, and you're to sharpen them and shape them, and He can and will use them. But it's not about that. It's about His power working in you and through you. Remember, faithful is He who called you, who will also do it. And so God answers Moses' you accusations. Remember, remember Moses had accused God? God, you haven't kept your promise at all. God, you haven't done what you said. You, you failed. And God answers those you accusations with I will promises. Notice what Moses says, though. Verse 9. Moses reports this to the Israelites. So he takes what God has said to them and he goes to them. But they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and their harsh labor. So God says, I want you to go tell this to, the, to your people. And he does. He obeys God. And they don't listen. And you can imagine Moses' discouragement level is just increasing and increasing. But God's not deterred and God's not put off because God is on his throne. He's working out his plan. Look at verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to Pharaoh, verse 12, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why should Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? And here we can really see Moses' struggle, can't we? He's wanting to be faithful to God. He's, he's wanting to obey God. But he's, his own people are now not even listening to what he has to say. Pharaoh already didn't listen to what he had to say one time. And when he did go to Pharaoh... Things didn't get better, they got worse. And now God's asking him to go back to Pharaoh again, and Moses is pushing back a little bit. He said, if my own people won't listen to me, why would Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, listen to me? And, and, and by the way, God, remember, I don't speak well, right? You know I get nervous, you know I get tongue-tied, you know I stutter. Pharaoh's just going to laugh at me. Common sense is telling Moses, you know what, it would probably be better at this point just to cut my losses and go home, right? You know, if you ever started something or you're trying to accomplish something and it's just not working and you get to a point where you say, you know what, enough time, energy, money has gone into this, it's better just to let it go, right? And move on. And I really think Moses is probably in that kind of a place where he's like, God, this isn't working. Like, I, I did what you asked me to do and I came here, but it's not working. And sometimes we find ourselves in that same spot. We feel like God's called us to something, but whatever reason, there's, something's happened or we've hit a roadblock or we're struggling and we just don't want to obey. Look at verse 13 though. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And so God reiterates his command. He says, Moses and Aaron, yes, I know things are difficult right now. And I know it hasn't looked like you thought it would look. Right? We talked about that yesterday. Following God doesn't always look like we think it's going to look. But he says, you are going to do this. I've commanded it. Now I want you to move down to verse 28. There's a lot of genealogy and information and we don't have time to, to get into this morning. But look at verse 28 of chapter 6. He says, Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses is still very reluctant. Look at verse 30. Moses said to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Moses is still pushing back against God. Right? And I know, I know from my own journey what that feels like. Right? When, when, I, when God called me here, to, to know him in a deeper way, but to ultimately serve him vocationally in ministry, I pushed back for a long time. And my, and my pushback, I think, in a lot of ways was, is sort of what Moses was feeling. It wasn't that I didn't want to do it, but I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't think I was able. I didn't think I had the giftedness. I didn't think I could, I could do it. I didn't think it would work out. And Moses says, this is not going to work out, God. But look at, verse, look at chapter 7. Beginning in verse 1, the Lord says to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, 
and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you. Right? Moses, you just need to be obedient to me. I'll work it out. You obey me. You speak what I command you. And your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. He says, Moses, your job is simply to obey me and to trust me in this. I've called you. I've placed you here. I'm going to do it. You just need to obey. But it's hard to obey when everything around us is pushing back and saying, obedience doesn't make any sense in this context. Notice what God says in verse 3. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Moses, I want you to go and say something, but Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. But you go anyway. It's part of my plan. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. And I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. God says, Moses, I just want you to obey me. It's not going to look like you think it's going to look. It's not going to go as well as you wish it did. But I am doing something that's bigger than you can understand. And I am accomplishing a purpose that's greater than you can even imagine. And listen, God's always doing that. He's always doing more than we see or understand at any moment in life. Right? There's always more going on. And God calls us to obey Him. And it might not look like God's doing a lot. Or we might not understand what He's doing. But he is working on behalf of his purposes and his people. Notice verse 6. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Despite his reluctance and despite his fears and his doubts and his insecurities, Moses and Aaron choose to obey God. And this obedience is going to position them to be used by God in a powerful way. Right? Many of you are familiar with the story. You know what's going to come next. Moses goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says no. God begins to bring plagues on Egypt. Right? Ten of them before Pharaoh will finally relent and let his people go. But it's Moses' obedience to God that positions him to be used in a powerful way for God. And so I want us to, to really think about our lives. The call that God has on your life. And how obedience is essential to that. Obedience is essential for following God into the unknown. You know, here at, at, at camp, there's many times, like today, that we give you a lot of instructions. right? And we don't give you those instructions because we just enjoy telling you what to do. Are you with me? Right? It's for your good. It's for the good of what we're trying to accomplish. That's why we say, at lunch, you need to have the things ready for dress rehearsal with you. You need to be ready to go because there's going to be a bus and there's going to be no time to go back. And so obeying is going to put you in position to be successful, right? And to accomplish what you came here to do and what God's wanting to do in your life. And in a very similar way, obedience to God positions us to fulfill His purposes. And there's going to be many times that God calls us to obey Him when it doesn't make sense and when common sense would say, don't do that. When our feelings say, don't do that, right? When other people say, don't do that, but God will call us to obey Him. And we push back sometimes, right? Moses pushed back because he really was doubting that this was going to work. And sometimes we push back on obedience because we're doubting. Sometimes it's just because we don't want to. How many of you have, don't raise your hands, how many of you ever disobeyed your parents simply because you didn't want to? All right, go ahead and raise your hands. You're, you're not on camera. All right. Well, we got a rough bunch here. Right? We've all been there, haven't we? Right? There, there's something within us that just said, I'm going to disobey them just because I don't want to. Or maybe I think they're trying to keep something from me. I remember at my grandparents' house, they had this cactus. You kind of know where this is going, right? They had a cactus. And they always told me, don't touch the cactus. Well, one day, my grandfather was showing everybody his flowers, and they all went around the corner, and there I was, alone with a cactus. <laughs> and I thought, I know why they, have not, they told me not to touch the cactus. There is immense pleasure and goodness in touching the cactus, and they just want to keep it from me. So I will touch the cactus. And I grabbed it. <laughs> and I screamed. <laughs> 
And my grandmother put me on her lap and with her tweezers picked them out one by one. And I never touched the cactus again. <laughs> I might be dumb, but I wasn't dumb enough to do it again. You know, sometimes we push back just because we don't want to, but we've got to fight that. God is not, God, when he asks you to obey him, it's not arbitrary, right? It's not just like, I'm going to give you a bunch of rules because I like giving rules. No, God always has a purpose and a reason. Sometimes it goes against our feelings, our desires. And in, 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 in this generation, we hear a lot about my truth or living my truth. But if you're a follower of Jesus, God isn't calling you to live your truth. Because you are not the source of truth. Truth does not come from you. Truth comes from God. Jesus was very clear. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so in this little verse, God, Jesus reminds us that he's the only way that anyone can have a relationship with God. But he is the truth. He is the source of truth. And so he calls us to place our obedience, our trust in him and his truth, in his word and in his will. And every time that we go against following God's truth, it's always a disaster. It, it might seem initially like it's working out okay, but it's always going to end terribly. Just like me and the cactus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, God is calling you to obey Him with your life. To say yes to Him. To say yes to His Word and the things that He's commanded us to do. To say yes to His will, to His leadings and His promptings that He places on our life. And as a follower of Jesus, that is a choice that is made out of love, not out of law. Are you with me? That God wants you to realize that His call to obey you is a call to respond to his love. Jesus says, if you love me, right, you obey my commandments. Right? God loves you so, so much. More than I can describe to you because even I cannot fully understand the love that God has for me and the love that he has for you. And listen, sometimes that's hard to believe. It's very easy for me to tell you that God loves you because I know it's true. I know it's true on the authority of God's word. But sometimes it's hard for me to believe that God loves me. Because I know me better than anyone else. And I know all the unlovable parts and all the unlovable things. And I know all the failures and mistakes and everything. But listen, God knows all about that. He knows everything about you. And when he saved you, he knew everything about your past. But he also knew everything about your future. And he knew all the times that you would fail him. He knew all the times that you would doubt him. Listen, when, when Jesus met Peter on the shore of Galilee and said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men, he knew that there would be a day that he would deny that he even knew who he was. But he called him anyway. And he forgave him after that and restored him and used him. God knows everything. He loves you with an unending love. And out of that love, he calls you to choose to obey him. To obey his word and to obey his will. And so I want to challenge you, in a world that will increasingly push back against that sort of obedience, to say, I'm going to be willing to live differently because God's put a call on my life. He's given me a call to know Him relationally through Jesus Christ. He gave His Son for me on the cross. Jesus died for you. He rose from the dead. He can and will, and for many of you, has forgiven you and given you a relationship whereby you're called son or daughter, heir to His kingdom and His glory. And he says, I want you to know how much I love you. I, I want you to, to go deep into my love so that you will understand that you can trust me and that you can obey me. And when you do, you will be positioned to serve God in a powerful way. I want to see God use your lives in incredible ways. I want to get messages and I want to see you know, things in the future, how you're living for God and serving God and following his purpose for your life. And I believe he's brought us here together to this place to show, him, to show us himself in a new way, to take us deeper in our faith and our, and our love for him, and to call us to follow him. And so I'm, I'm asking you to, to wrestle with what is God calling you to, but then what is he asking you to obey? And I believe maybe for some of you, there's an area of life that is, you're not living in obedience to Jesus, and you know it. 
and God's convicting you about it. There's guilt, and you kind of push it back, and you, you push it down, and God's wanting to deal with that, and He wants you to, to come to a place of obedience because He loves you. He's willing to forgive that, and He wants to help you see the joy that comes from obedience. You know, our first instinct is that obedience will restrict my joy or my fun or my freedom, but it's the exact opposite. It's in obedience to Jesus that we find the greatest joy and the greatest freedom. To know that we're set free from sin, we're free to know God, free to love Him, free to serve Him, free to enjoy our relationship with Him with now and forever. And so if you're holding on to an area of disobedience, I want to encourage you to deal with it. Confess it, right? Maybe tell someone to pray with you about it to get accountability or encouragement. And for all of us, would we make a commitment to say, God, I want to obey. I'm not going to do it perfectly. None of us will. But I want the direction of my life, the aim of my life, to be one of obedience. Obedience that's born out of knowing the love of God for me in Christ. To know His deep and unending love. Right? And His love that, that never ends. And His love isn't dependent on your performance or your behavior. He loves you always and eternally. And so out of that love to say, God, I want to follow you. I want to obey you. Here's my life. Help me. Right? Help me to obey. And get some people around you in life that also want to obey Jesus. Because it's easier to do it together when we have encouragement and motivation. And I believe if you'll make that choice, you'll see God use your life in incredible ways for His glory and His kingdom. He has a great plan for your life. Let's pray. Father, I, I, I pray for us this morning. I know there's some times that, that we push back on obeying you. And sometimes we push back on obeying you because we have fears and doubts like Moses did. It's not that we want to disobey you, but we're scared. We're intimidated. We're insecure. And Father, I just pray that you'd help us in those places to just do what Moses did, which is to say, I feel all those things, but I'm going to do what you've commanded me to do. Help us to, to have that level of trust. Father, if it's a situation where we're just not wanting to do something. Father, help us to see the sinfulness of our hearts and to confess that and to deal with that. And Father, if it's willful disobedience, Father, I pray that you'd convict us so that we'd come to you. Father, I thank you that you've promised that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So help us to know that we don't have to hide, that we don't have to hide our sin or our failure from you because you already see it. And when we bring it to you, you forgive it and you cleanse it. You remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and you remember them no more. So, Father, may we run to your grace and we run to your mercy. And then, Father, may you give us the courage to obey you. The courage to, to trust you, to obey your word and to obey your will. And, Father, I pray that as we do that, you would use our lives in a great way for your glory. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.